We're going to again be in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 through 10, if you have your Bibles, page 945 on the Black Bible. Otherwise, the words will be on the wall. Um, we're going to start in verse 1, and we're going to read down to verse 10. Now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section, in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section, performing their ritual duties, but into the second only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. Excuse me. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We took a break last week as Pastor Roland came and he visited us and he shared with us um, I thought that that was a great thing for him after three years of being absent from the church for him to join us and just share what was on his heart out of John chapter two. But as we continue our text this morning, we're journeying through Hebrews as we have been for some time. The writer here unpacks in far more detail something we addressed the last time we were here when he starts talking about the tent or the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, which was the place and the center of worship for the people of Israel. Now, looking as he does at this earthly counterpart of that whole thing, he's trying to address the heavenly dwelling and the purpose on that. And the focus today for us here is going to be in the second room, the most holy place, not the first room, because that has already passed, and we'll get to that at some point. But the focus will be on the second room, helping these people understand that. And what I want us to focus on this morning also, in relation to that, is not the entire 10 verses, although we could do that, but I'm sure people want to get to the Maple Fest before the sun goes down and eat their dinner. Rather, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at one verse this morning in context of all 10 verses. And I want us to look at specifically verse 4 in the relation to this whole chapter, because it gives us a few things that are very important for us to understand as we look to understand why the writer references these three things specifically. He goes out of his way to list them. It's not that the rest of the chapter doesn't matter. In fact, it does make a big difference. But these three things help us to understand God and they help us to understand his relationship to his people more clearly. Where his heart is at is in relation to those who we're gonna be looking at and we are included in that as his people. So if you're taking notes this morning, it'll be on the screen, but if you're taking notes this morning, we're gonna be looking at three things specifically as we journey through that text. Number one, we're gonna be taking a look at the manna. The manna in relation to God's provision for his people. We're gonna be looking at Aaron's staff, number two, in relation to God's calling of his people. And number three, we're gonna be taking a look at the tablets in relation to God's instruction for his people. And finally, by way of application, as we close this morning, sometime around two o'clock this afternoon, we're gonna take a look at... <laughs> Okay, so you're all still awake. <laughs> We're gonna take a look at the tent of meeting in relation to God's faithfulness to his people. I think that all of those things are very important. And what these three things represent, it helps us to see the history of God's people as we walk through this. And we look to remember first and foremost, and this is important for us all as we sit here and we watch our time this morning, is to remember first and foremost that the inability of the people of God to do the right thing at the right time, no matter how many times they have been instructed to do so. And in light of that truth, we're going to see that God always provides reminders and pointers along the way 
And even more importantly, he reminds them that they are always going to have a way in which to get back to him no matter what they do, even in their rebellion. That's the faithfulness of God in it all. So number one, the manna. What's the deal with that? Hebrews chapter nine, verses three and four. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place. Having the golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold in which was the golden urn holding the manna. Now inside the ark with all of the details that they give, all of the focus is on the ark here inside this second room. And Moses was commanded when it came to this ark to place certain things in there. Don't just fill it with trinkets that you think are neat and cool. But there are specific things that I want you to put inside there, and purposefully so, that are going to help the people of Israel remember what it is they have gone through. These are going to be elements that are going to remind them of their life and what it is they've dealt with. Why? Because human beings, by nature, have a very short memory. We just do. Especially when we are dealing with change. Especially when we are challenged and when we are under pressure in life and we can't figure out how to maintain control and keep our thumb on everything so that we're super comfortable and feeling like we're actually running the whole ship and masters of our own destiny. When we struggle how to navigate with our new reality because God has pushed us into a place of change. And so in looking at the manna, We discover, if we journey back into the story of the people of Israel, that they were already complaining, already complaining about how much better things were in the old days back in Egypt. Exodus 16, verses 1 through 3. If if you have your Bibles, there's a second book in there. Otherwise, again, you'll have it in front of you on the screen. They set out from Elam. And all the congregation of the people of Israel came into the wilderness of sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. Now, when you read the Bible, remember, it's God's word and everything is there for a purpose. So let's hit this one. On the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. Now, my mathematics isn't great, but that tells me they are six weeks out. That's all. Six weeks out. Not even summer vacation for you kids that are in here. But they're six weeks in their journey, and the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Oh, would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. (laughs) When we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. Again, a quick pause. Remember, they were slaves in Egypt. I'm not thinking meat pots and all kinds of parties were happening while they were there. But anyway, this is how they're remembering it because it's tough for them right now. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Six weeks. Six weeks is all it takes for the grumblers to start pointing the finger at the elders and Moses who have led them into not necessarily the desert, but freedom by the grace of God. Because why? Their bellies are empty. They haven't eaten for about 10 minutes. They had forgotten completely all that God had done for them in order to help them get out of Egypt and be put into the desert. And what's God's response? Does he zap fry him out in the desert and go to look for new people? No, he doesn't. Verses four through six, the Lord said to Moses, behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day. In other words, I'm gonna make sure their bellies aren't empty that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So they're not going to be working seven days a week, only six. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, at evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. I'm not going to zap fry them and bury them and go start over. The purpose of God's provision here in the bread was very simply that they would remember that he was the one who was in control, no matter how hard it looked, that he was the one who would provide for them because he had brought them out of Egypt and he had made them his own and that he can be trusted in the midst of everything. They could trust him. They could do so because they knew that he would take care of them even when they were faithless 
even when they were grumbling along the way and complaining that things weren't exactly the way they wanted. You see, one of the lessons we have to learn here is that part of the problem of the people of Israel is that they were human. They were human beings. And what that means, whether we like it or not here in 2023, is that the default pattern of humanity has not changed one bit. It is always the place of brokenness and sin and of complaining, no matter how much God pours out his blessing. These people had witnessed God's powerful hand of deliverance in Egypt. They had witnessed his protection with the Passover lamb having been sacrificed, as well as the parting of the Red Sea. Remember, they are a short six weeks out, not even a summer vacation. It all culminated with their deliverance from Egypt and the destruction of the entire Egyptian army. And yet they're complaining. And what do we see on God's side? What we see from him is that his heart is always to save his people, to protect his people, to provide for his people, and to grow his people. We need to remember that. No matter where you find yourself struggling with anything, the manna was the reminder of God's provision in the unsettled desert moments of their life. That no matter how bad it gets, he is always right there. And it was very important for the people that were receiving this letter, probably some 2,000 years on for them as well, because they too were unsettled. And they were beginning to look back at the comfort of the temple and what that provided for them in Jerusalem. All of the rituals, all of the sacrifices that they knew about that had just become absolute ritual and were not connecting them with God. Why were they doing that? Because it was what they knew. How many of us understand that? When we are in unsettled places, we always want to go back to what we know. Even if what we know isn't good. It's what we know. That's where they wanted to be. That's where they found their safety. It's where they found security. It's where they found stability. These are all lessons we can learn today. They had the protection at that point. You see, as we take a look at these things, their forefathers had all of that safety, that security and stability as slaves in Egypt. These people who received this letter were dealing with the same thing, except they were dealing with Rome. They weren't dealing with Egypt. They had been recognized and they were tolerated by the people who had them under their thumb. Rome ruled Israel just like Egypt did. They weren't completely free. They didn't really rule their own country. They had to be compliant with the powers that be, and then they were protected. They were really in the same situation. They were still slaves, but they were secure. But now as followers of Jesus, they're being pushed to the fringe. They're being challenged in the wilderness of how do we make this new life of people of the way work in a world that doesn't like that because they were being rejected by their own people and they were being persecuted by Rome. So the writer sat down with a pen and he wrote this letter to remind the people of what's going on. It was becoming very hard for them in the wilderness they were just vagabond wanderers journeying around looking for the sun. They were in change and transition, trying to figure out how to live out this life that Jesus had called them to. And they grumbled about being hungry and that it was much better in Egypt. These folks weren't looking to go back to Egypt. They were looking to go back to the temple and all of the dead ritual was there. And what does God do? He doesn't stop the car and boot them to the curve. You know, like we're on a vacation and our kids are a little bit more irritated than they should be, for the 900th time in half a mile, are we almost there yet? No, he didn't park the car on the side of the road, tell him to get out and walk. He doesn't let them go back to Egypt, which they could have done. You know what he does? He provides for them. In the middle of it all, he provides for them. He gives manna from heaven. That's what they called it, that food that will sustain you. They had it day after day after day after day. Now, let's jump it forward to the application for us here. Because Jesus, years on, after having just fed 5,000 people with a few loaves and a couple fish, is now being challenged by the crowd. And they said to him, what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? Really? What sign? 
What work do you perform? Our fathers did what? They ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven, but my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. The picture of the manna points us to our Savior, who is the permanent bread from heaven, who gives life to all who will come to him. Even in the midst of all of the unsettledness, Jesus is that life-giving manna wherever you find yourself. Never, ever forget God's provision for you. Most especially in the worst time, in the worst situation in your life, never forget. You see, that's why the manna was in the ark. They needed to know that. We can't forget God's call either upon our life. That's another important thing. Part of verse four in chapter nine is Aaron's staff that budded. What is that all about? Oh, glad you asked or we'd be done we're going to move on and we're going to discover that we need to remember God always provides for his people but we have to remember that he does so in his timing and through his means we don't make it happen we just need to be faithful he also calls according to his sovereign purposes and his perfect plan he calls according to his sovereign purposes and his perfect plan not according to our expertise and qualifications you know Roland hit on that last week when he was preaching And that's so very true. And how do I know that? Well, I can think about it because I know me better than anybody. And the only other person that knows me better than me is back teaching kids church right now. And her name's Lisa. I promise you this morning, there's at least a thousand men, if not 10,000 men, far more qualified than I am to stand in this pulpit and teach you every Sunday. Far more qualified than I am. Yet it is God in his deep sense of humor who has put me here. And I love you too, Johnny. But God has set me down here. God has called me here. I know the blackness of my heart. I know the struggles that I face. I question quite often why he's called me. But that is not the point. This isn't belittling myself. This is a realization of who I am as a human being. And I want to encourage everybody to think in this way. I'm very confident in the here. I'm not always confident in the who. I know he's got me to be here. I just don't know why he's got me. We are not called to be experts, as Roland said last week. We are called to be servants. And so when I understand that God has set me down here, this is where I need to be. And so when we look at this air and we can understand that there were probably at least a thousand other people or men in the other tribes of Israel who are far more qualified than this guy. Just a quick study of him in Exodus 32, if you wanted something for homework this week, would show that. Because Moses is up on the mountain, he's getting the Ten Commandments. Aaron was down in the encampment, giving in to the will of the people. One of the worst leadership qualities on planet Earth a leader can ever have. Giving in to the will of the people. But that's what he was doing nonetheless. Moses, it seemed, was taking a little bit too long up on the hill. Gone for one too many days, so the people are starting to panic. They wanted something to worship. Bad news right there. If Aaron had been the leader he was supposed to, he'd have kicked them back in line. Lovingly, of course. But he'd have kicked them back in line. Instead, he said, okay, bring all the gold you have. Give me all the earrings you got. We'll melt it down. We'll have it put into something. And all of a sudden, out comes a cow, the golden calf. And the next thing you know, God's people are dancing around this golden calf and dancing around the fire and doing all kinds of other things that they ought not to do. Talk about I've been gone five minutes and the house is burning down. They think that that was their God. And yes, the man that God chose to lead as the high priest of the people of Israel was not only condoning this, he was the one that actually pushed it forward and was the reason for it happening. And yet in number 17, God tells Moses, I want you to take one staff 
from 12 men, one from each of the tribes of Israel. Aaron happened to be one of those men. Put it in a tent of meeting, leave it for the night, and I will tell you who it is I'm going to have be the high priest of my people. The next morning Moses goes in, and we read in verse 8 through 11, the next day Moses went into the tent of the testimony, and behold, the staff of Aaron for the house of Levi had sprouted and put forth buds and produced blossoms, and it bore ripe almonds. Then Moses brought out all the staffs from before the Lord to all the people of Israel. And they looked, and each man took his staff. And the Lord said to Moses, put back the staff of Aaron before the testimony to be kept as a sign for the rebels, that you may make an end to their grumbling against me, lest they die. Thus Moses, thus did Moses as the Lord commanded him. We have two hints here in God's calling. One, that it's not about your expertise or experience. It's also not about your past. The mediator that God sets between his people and himself is as dysfunctional as any one of us sitting here in this room. But it's not about our past, is it? That's dead and buried when we come to Christ. You see, it was God who chose this earthly high priest. It was God who chose him to represent the people. It wasn't Aaron's call. Do you think Aaron was the best choice based upon the information we have? Probably not. In fact, I highly doubt it. It doesn't look like it with what we have, but he was God's choice. You see, he was God's choice. The issue with Aaron, as I said at the beginning of the sermon, was that he was Aaron. That's the problem with him. Just because he was called of God doesn't change his personality. You come to Christ, that doesn't mean all of a sudden you're going to wake up tomorrow morning and everything's going to be fine and dandy. You know, you're the next Billy Graham. No, you're still going to trip over the cat, probably kick the cat, say stuff you shouldn't say to the cat. Sorry, Mel. (laughs) It's always a cat, I know. All of those things are going to happen. That doesn't just go away. When I tell people, when, when God called me, I just remind them I'm a huge jerk with Jesus. My wife will attest to that. Imagine what I was like before him. The problem with Aaron was he was Aaron. The problem with any one of us is we're us. Our personalities don't change when we come to Christ. We need to learn to put to death the things that are no good so that we can bring to life the things that God wants growing in us. And that was what he was trying to do with Aaron. There was never a sudden change and all of a sudden... He's just this totally different person. But he did understand that God had called him. That is God's grace. That's why there's nothing we can do to be acceptable before him. And I find great pleasure in that because I don't need to do anything except say yes. And then what do you want from me, Lord? It's something that we all need to get a hold of in relation to his grace and his mercy. Because the one constant in the story of God's people is their inconsistency in the midst of his constant, constant blessing. Their constant failure to live up to their end of the covenant agreement. Why do you think that's in the Bible? So that we can be reminded that in the middle of God's provision, God's calling comes to us and it is about what he has done in and through Christ for us. All we need to do is walk in what he tells us. We struggle with the same things. No matter how hard we try, our sins and our weaknesses will always get in the way. They are a daily battle for us. We'll unpack that more next week as we take a look at another part of chapter 9. They are our constant adversary. Stop thinking that the person sitting next to you is your biggest problem. They could very well be a big problem. But the biggest problem anybody sitting here faces in any given day is the person looking back at them in the mirror in the morning. That's just a fact. It's a fact. In the middle of all of this stuff, we need to recall that Aaron messed up more than once, that Moses messed up more than once, that all of the people messed up more than once. Peter messed up more than once. John, James, you pick it. You messed up more than once. I have messed up more than once. It is the one guarantee in this world except for taxes and death. But we can never forget that God has called you. 
That's what the Bible tells us. God has called you. If you are in Christ, he has called you by grace through faith. That is calling and that election, Paul tells us, is absolutely assured and certain. Please don't run through this life thinking if you've stubbed your toe and you've sworn at the dog and you've taken the Lord's name in vain, you need to come back down to the altar to be resaved. If you have been saved, you have been saved. Period. That's what the scripture says. It is sure and guaranteed. And the Bible is assuring us in that because it tells us that over and over again, that it is God who guarantees our salvation. It is him who calls because we all mess up at least once before we finish this race. But he tells us, you can be assured that I have saved you once for all time. You may mess up and you may wander, but you'll always come back because I'm not going to let go of you even when you want to let go of me. That's the whole thing that's being painted here. That's why we must remember God's provision. That's why the people of Israel needed to remember God's provision. It's why they needed to remember God's calling. They needed to remember his calling. Because that helps us in our unsettled times. Just like those who were receiving this letter, they needed to be assured of what was going on with what Jesus had done for them. Now, there are many here today, many of you right now, I don't know what all of you are going through. I know what some of you are going through. But each one of you and each one of us is dealing with different things in our lives. We're being challenged with health issues. We're being challenged with age issues. We're being challenged with personal struggles, problems at work, figuring out how it is we're supposed to navigate this world in the way it is. Some of you are dealing with things far more difficult than others are. Some of you are perhaps just each day trying to figure out how to navigate this world as a follower of Jesus. Remember. God has called you. He has called you and he has set you down here. And in the midst of that calling, he will provide what you need through every challenge you have. But you have to step into that provision and calling. That's the work that you have. Because you see, Jesus is the doorway through which we pass. It is through him that God has reconciled the work back to himself. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And he has given us that ministry of reconciliation. And he's calling you to be a part of that plan. And God don't make mistakes. Pretty good English there, isn't it? Jesus came to fulfill the law by showing us all how to live out its instructions as well. That's the third thing left in the ark, isn't it? We have the manna to remember his provision for us. We have the staff to be assured of our calling. And now we have the tablets of the covenant, verse 4 tells us. Learning to live out God's law in a living and breathing way. Not just checking the boxes, but having it in our hearts, not just our heads. How do we get it from here to here? How do we live it out? You see, we're to become living stones Living stones in this world. We are to live out what is then written upon our hearts. And remember two weeks ago, verse 10 in chapter 8, what does it say? For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law into their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. That's God's heart for his people. In the ark was the reminder of God's instructions. You are my people. You are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. Now, I dare say that many of us get up on a Monday morning and probably don't feel that way. That's why feelings are dangerous. Because feelings are deceitful. Not that they're not real, but they will make us believe things if we think on them long enough that are untrue according to what the Bible tells us. You are a chosen generation people, a royal priesthood. You see, in the most holy place in this tent, only the mediator could go. Only the high priest could go in, into that place. And that's where the ark sat in the most holy place. In there were these items reminding his people that you are mine. You are mine, and I am yours. 
It is by grace and through faith that you belong to me. It is by grace and through faith that you have arrived at this mountain, Mount Sinai. Here is how I want you to live your life now as I send you out into this world. These tablets of stone, but I want you to write them on your hearts. I want you to live out these commandments in a way that affects the world and changes the world. Psalm 119, verses 10 and 11. With my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. That writer got that. He understood that it was more than just a tablet of stone. It was a living thing. The people, however, didn't get it. They didn't understand that. They turned all of those things into ritual, into religion, into checking the boxes. And they thought that by doing all those things, that was the way that God loved them and saved them when he had already called them and saved them. This is how I want you to live in my world. And if we're honest this morning, and we all should be, because it is the only way that we grow, if we are honest this morning, we have to admit it's far easier to check a box. It is a lot easier for me to check a box, to read a verse or two, and to quote it when it suits us and suits me than it is to actually love my enemies, for example. I just let that hang there for a minute because I have a hard time with that. So I'm still processing it in my head. It is very easy for me to stand up here and say that you have to love your enemies, especially when your enemies hate you, because that's what the Bible tells us. I would rather just check the box and say, I did my devotion and it was great. I was up at three o'clock in the morning. We're good to go. And then somebody comes and says something really nasty and mean to me and hollers and yells or says something about my wife or whatever it may be. And now all of a sudden I got to make a choice. I have to make a choice. And I know that that's a challenge for many of you here. You could be the only one in your workplace or for you teens that are here, you could be the only one in your school who stands up at any point and says, you know what, Jesus is too important to me. He tells me I can't do A, B, and C, and if I'm the only one standing there, I have to stand there. And I understand that that's difficult. And I'll acknowledge the fact that I'm not in your world. I'm in the safety of being a pastor in my office, in the church. I don't go out into the world each day and try to work these things out as you do, although I do try to work them out. But I pray for every one of you as a congregation, every single one of you, that you have the ability to stand, that you have the ability to make the right choices according to what his word says, even in the face of opposition, and most especially when you find yourself standing alone, because it's not a comfortable place to be. And I want to say to you teenagers, in a world that continues to turn itself upside down every single day, God's word does not change to satisfy the cultural stories and norms that we have. It simply does not. And the joy we can find, as hard as it is, is in knowing that truth. Stand on his word and remember God's provision. Remember God's calling to you. And remember his instructions for our way of living and representing him in the world. Every single thing we do should point to Jesus. Because not only did he live in such a way that the scriptures literally had hands and feet, for 33 years. Not only did he live that way, but let's remember what he said were the most important commandments when it came to that. We are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? That's loving God. That's the first four commandments. He says, oh, but wait a minute. Doesn't end there. There's a second one that's just as important. Love your neighbor as yourself because that takes care of the last six of what will be written on the tablet. That's the important thing we have here. All the law and the prophets are summed up just in those two things. Don't overcomplicate it. Love God, love people, tell them why. Have a good day. I mean, we can have deep theological discussions, but when you're out and about, love God, love people, tell them why. But that's hard, isn't it? Very hard as we come to a close and a conclusion. These Hebrews needed this reminder of God's faithfulness. His provision, his calling, his instruction are all found in Jesus, the better way. But by way of application here, I think that this is probably the most important thing for us to remember this morning. In all things, no matter how far away you may have run, no matter how many times you may have messed up, the people of Israel are a perfect example that God always provides a way and the access back to himself, no matter what you do. His provision, his calling, his instruction, 
and now he provides a way. Exodus 33 tells us that the tent of meeting had to be moved outside of the camp while they were still parked at Mount, uh, Mount Sinai. Why? Because they could not get it right and God could not be with the people who couldn't behave. But here is what God had to say to Moses. This is the beauty of the Bible. This is the beauty of Jesus. And it is the beauty that you share with a world that says there's no way this is the way it can be. This is what God says. He who created everybody, go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go among you lest I consume you on the way. That's grace. That's what that is. As much as it sounds like it's not, you know why that's grace? Because he chose to stay when he wanted to be with his people in order for his people to be able to survive. He says so. You're a stiff-necked people. When the people heard this disastrous word, what happened? They mourned. No one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, say to the people, you're a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go among you, I would consume you. That's why God was out in the tent of meeting outside the camp, in order that he could still have a relationship with his people. And this is how important it is. Now take off your ornaments that I may know what to do with you. Therefore, the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. What is amazing here is that in spite of the people's sin and rebellion, in spite of the fact that God said you're a stiff-necked people, in spite of the fact that he had to separate himself, God guarantees a mediator between he and his people in order that his people can always have a way home. And the man's name at that time was Moses. Why? It's a picture and a pointer once again to this Jesus. God provides, Exodus 33 and verse 11, Moses is in the tent of meeting. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with a friend. If I've got one person among you, he will be the one that comes back to tell you about my grace. He spoke to Moses face to face, pointing us all to Jesus the friend of tax collectors, sinners, drunks, prostitutes, thieves, murderers, all of that. Moses, the tent of meeting, all of these things point us where? To Jesus. I leave you with this text as we have one last song. John chapter 14, verses five and nine, as Jesus is preparing to go and he's trying to sort these things out with his disciples, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way. I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Philip, picking up on what Jesus is doing, says to him, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough. Now listen to this. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long that you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Because in Jesus, every one of us have our provision. In Jesus, every one of us understand our calling. In Jesus, every one of us have the ability to follow the instructions. And what makes it the best of all is that by the grace of God in heaven, the King of the universe, The Savior, Jesus of Nazareth, says to each one of you, I am your friend. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And that, to me, is one of the greatest promises we can grab onto on any given day. 